So I think Tupac had it right. Trust nobody. At least when it comes to exchanging value and transacting, you really can't. Trust is outdated. I mean, for most of human history, our transactions happened face to face. So we could kind of get away with it. We started with a barter economy. Everything was trade-based. For example, I had a goat. You had two chickens. So we'd find a time to meet. If I didn't like your chickens, well, I'd just take my goat and I'd go home. The downside was an inconvenience. But we know people are in the market for more than just goats and chickens. We needed a more ubiquitous way to transact, which is where we have fiat currency or paper money. Now, with a uniform currency, I could go to work, create some value, and then I get paid in dollars. I take those dollars, I deposit some in the bank, I buy some groceries, and then I go home. Now, the problem here is we've added a few layers of trust. We're trusting the bank to safely secure my money. I'm trusting a third-party intermediary to facilitate some of these transactions. And I'm also trusting the Federal Reserve that they're going to be responsible with the supply of money. And through history, we've seen all three levels. That trust has been broken. We've seen banks go bankrupt, money gone. We've seen these intermediaries take a point off purchase. And we've seen extreme examples of hyperinflation, where a government wants to fund a political agenda, so they print twice as much money overnight. The populace now, half as rich. And now we've moved into this age of globalization, and we've piled on the amount of trust that we need. Now, on one side, it's amazing. We get to have global access in this amount of value that we create and can capture. But on the other side, a lot of times we're never even meeting the people that we're transacting with. We have whole asset classes that are purely digital. Now, let me give you an example of how trust can be broken in this scenario. So a couple years ago, I wanted to go to a Jays game, but it was sold out back when they were still winning games. So I try and find some tickets on the aftermarket. I find someone online, and I do an e-transfer, and he emails me the tickets. Boom, I'm on my way to the game. Except I'm not. Because when I show up, it turns out these tickets are fake. Now, it was a little bit embarrassing, because I was on a date. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I still go home, I have a roof over my head, food on the table, and I'm safe. But not all of these instances are so inconsequential. Let me tell you about a friend of mine whose family immigrated here to provide a better life for him and all his siblings. Now, before they get here, they need a place to live. So the parents go online, they find an apartment, they sign a lease, and they send first and last month's rent. And when they show up to Canada, excited about this new life and new opportunities, they show up to their new house. You know who greets them? Someone who's never even heard of them before. They got scammed. That lease, garbage. First and last month's rent, gone. But most importantly, they're homeless. They moved across the world excited for this new opportunity, and they don't even have a home. Now, what if there was a better way? What if we didn't even need trust? We didn't need to rely on trust, we could throw it out the window. Now, in 2008, we were introduced to a better way in Bitcoin. And it came at a really interesting time, just weeks after the financial collapse. Trust at an all-time low. So this person or collection of people under the alias Satoshi Nakamoto proposes a new financial system that takes the characteristics of gold, a finite supply, 21 million Bitcoin, never more, never less but the mobility of a digital currency. And it also takes out all trusted third parties. So it's trustless. Now, trustless is this term, this paradoxical term that I love. 
it implies that there is so much confidence that you don't even need to rely on trust. So how did Bitcoin accomplish this? Well, accomplish this through the blockchain. Now we may ask ourselves, what is the blockchain? It seems like this term that we see on the cover of every publication. Everyone's talking about it, but I'm not sure everyone truly understands what it is. Now, quite simply, the blockchain is a digital ledger, a balance sheet, but no one owns it. It's distributed globally. It's a fundamental shift in thinking that actually the most secure way to run a financial system is to be open, transparent, and collaborative, completely orthogonal to how we traditionally think about financial systems. So in the context of Bitcoin, what does this look like? It means that Satoshi created 21 million Bitcoin, and he commits this to the public ledger. But in order to commit to this to the public ledger, it actually goes before a collection of nodes. And these are powerful computers. These powerful computers reach consensus on this transaction and then add it to the blockchain. And to give you a little bit of context, there are 10,000 of these nodes around the world. So this truly is a distributed global set of ledgers. So it's added to the blockchain. This is the first block, the Genesis block, with 21 million Bitcoin. And any iteration needs to actually go before these set of nodes and reach consensus. No one entity controls any changes to the financial system. So for example, Satoshi distributes some of these. Luckily, I was one of these people. Not actually in the original. But they're at, so it's distributed. And then once those nodes confirm it, it gets added to the next block. You see, we have a chain of blocks, the blockchain. But what's really important is that each subsequent block has a reference to the previous block. So you see that originally there were 21 million Bitcoin created, never more, never less. Satoshi could not go create a million more Bitcoin and put that in his account. So if I want to make a transfer, I actually have to commit this to the blockchain, set of nodes reaches consensus, and then it gets transferred. And this blockchain is actually stored among these 10,000 nodes. And they have to reach consensus on each transaction, and they store each of these, so it's open and transparent. But if we're going to be open and transparent with our financials, we need a certain level of security. So this is where cryptography comes in. Why referred to as a cryptocurrency. Because through cryptography, every person has a specific identity on the blockchain that is protected. Now, this is a, tr a trustless peer-to-peer -peer financial system. But what gets me excited is all of the things that are being built on top of this, the innovation that's happening around blockchain. Bitcoin was blockchain 1.0. And we're starting to see more and more innovation. I would argue that blockchain 2.0, probably one of the most fundamental innovations in the blockchain space, happened right here at UW, in Ethereum. Now, Ethereum takes blockchain and is able to actually write smart contracts. It adds logic to the blockchain. So in the context of the Jays tickets, for example, Jays create 20,000 tickets. They're all uniquely identified on blockchain, and they're distributed. Now, here I am. I have some money. And here's Brandon. He has some tickets. I want two of those tickets. So I actually commit some dollars or uh, tokens to this transaction. And Brandon commits the tickets. Now it solves two things. One, I have confidence that these tickets are real. Brandon has confidence that I actually have the money for it. But also, it solves this fundamental problem that we sometimes have. Do I send the money first, or does Brandon send the tickets first? I can commit one side, Brandon commits the other. And then once they're confirmed by the nodes, the switch happens. Now I have the tickets. I'm actually on, the, on my way to the game. Now, why am I up here talking about Jay's tickets in the blockchain? The reality is I actually don't really care. I haven't really thought about that game until just recently. But what I do care about is my friend who moves across the world and ends up homeless. This is not a one-off event. This is not an exclusive one time. These things happen every single day. People rely on trust, and trust fails them. 
But if we want to actually commit some numbers to this, 2.5 billion people across the world are unbanked or financially underserved. And they're generating about 4.5 billion transactions per day. That means a third of the world is relying on trust for every single transaction. But not just that, they're limited to transacting with people they can, they can actually reach face to face. So as we push forward in this age of globalization, they are not connected. A third of the world is being left behind. Now the blockchain offers an opportunity for us to actually include those people. And for us globally to not have to rely on trust, to be able to exchange value very easily peer to peer. Now what does the world look like when we're all actually connected? Well one, we have access, global access, we just talked about. But two, each and every one of us is an entrepreneur. We create an immense amount of value every single day. We're just not collecting our paychecks. In this age where we're all connected, we're creating these data points, and we're creating this immense amount of value, but it's fragmented. And we actually don't even control that. This is what it looks like today, for example. Google knows what I'm searching for. Spotify knows what I'm listening to. Facebook knows where I've been, and they control that data, and that's how they fund their business model. And there's two things that happen here. One, I'm on the outside looking in. I'm the one creating this value and not capturing any of that. But then two, these are very fragmented sets of data. For example, for the past six months, I've been getting these ads for diapers. Because about six months ago, I searched, what do you buy a one-year-old for their birthday? Because I have a friend who has a one-year-old. But after that, I'm not in the market for diapers. So this data on its own sometimes isn't even that valuable. And these centralized entities are controlling that. It's very hard to get that data. There's actually firms that will do it. And I tried really hard to get a bunch of the data that I've been generating. And one, it's hard. And then B, it's very cumbersome. But if we're actually all connected through the blockchain, we can actually become a stakeholder in this. This data is aggregated. And then one, I can become the owner of this and actually choose when and how I share it. I can rent that data out. I can sell that data. But it would be selling and renting for the purpose of magnified experiences, richer experiences. For example, now, if I'm shopping on Amazon, instead of being offered an ad for diapers, it would probably know that I care about some recent natural disaster that I've been reading about a lot on Twitter. And it says at the end of my purchase, do you want to donate to this? Yes, absolutely. That's something that's more valuable for me and others than an ad that I don't care about. But also, it allows all of these centralized entities that are holding onto this data and trying to make a really valuable experience, it actually allows them to create rich experience. For example, maybe I book an Airbnb. Airbnb knows that I've been listening to a lot of Justin Bieber lately. It says, hey, there's a concert while you're here about five miles away. Do you want tickets? Yes. Ticketmaster just made some revenue. And hey, we'll book a ride for you. Boom. Lyft just made some revenue. So now I'm having a much richer experience. These businesses are able to create richer experiences and bring other businesses in. And ultimately, everyone's creating more value. So what does the blockchain really offer? Well, number one, it creates access. It allows us to have an inclusive financial system where we don't need to rely on trust and we can create this value. But it also allows us to capture value. Now, if I bring it back to Tupac, though, don't trust me. I want you to go find out for yourself. And I promise you'll get pretty excited. Thank you.